This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including John Atwood, Pat, and DeGracia A. Daniels. Coming up on DTNS, why companies are giving up on voice assistance, dubbed YouTube videos are the next big video wave, and Dr. Nikki explains why a doctor could soon prescribe robots instead of traditional antibiotics. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, March 6th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From Alabama, I'm Dr. Nikki Ackerman. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. My friends, we are going to fill you with robots today. Thanks to Dr. Nikki being here. I can't wait to talk about this story. (laughs) But let's start with the quick hits. Back in 2021, WhatsApp said it would share business user data with Facebook, and everybody freaked out, and that led to the European Consumer Organization, or the BEUC, and the European Network of Consumer Authorities to argue last year that Meta's WhatsApp violated the law by not clarifying the changes in plain and intelligible language. On Monday, the European Commission announced Meta agreed to be more transparent about changes to its privacy policy. WhatsApp will explain changes to EU users' contracts, how these could affect their rights, will more prominently display ways for users to accept or reject the changes, and make sure users can better control pop-up notifications on updates. Meta did not say if these changes will come to any markets where it doesn't have to do them, in other words, outside the EU. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, he's got sources, and they report that Apple might ship a new iMac in the second half of the year at the earliest with new M-series chip, and that would likely be an M3. Gurman sources say three new Macs are set to launch in late spring and summer, likely a 15-inch MacBook Air, a Mac Pro with an M2 Ultra chip, and a refreshed 13-inch MacBook Air. SoundCloud began testing a vertical discovery feed on its iOS and Android apps. With this, SoundCloud also rolled out 30-second previews. Users can like these snippets to add the full version to the playlist. SoundCloud also redesigned the Feed tab, which features a new discovery page with algorithmically suggested content as well as a following page. The Discover page will show captions saying what likes or followed artists it used to determine the suggestion. And just checking, yes, it's been about six years since people began predicting SoundCloud would go away any minute. Happy anniversary. Several Microsoft things to tell you about. They had all the news today. Microsoft announced a new experimental feature for Edge called Video Super Resolution. This upscales 720p or lower quality video that doesn't have DRM protection. It works on NVIDIA RTX 2030 and 40 series cards and AMD Radeon RX 5700 through RX 7800 cards, so it works on both, not just tied into one graphics architecture. Currently, some users of Edge's Canary builds can access the feature. Microsoft also released a new AI assistant in preview called Dynamics 365 Copilot based on OpenAI's technology. The software can draft contextual chat and email answers to customer questions, help marketers choose customer categories to target, and write product listings to sell goods and services. We're not done yet, folks. Microsoft says more AI announcements are planned for a March 16th event at 11 a.m. Eastern related to workplace productivity, and that likely pertains to its Office software suite. And finally, our Outlook for Mac is now usable for free. You could always just download it, but until now, you needed a Microsoft 365 subscription or a license to use it. Now, you don't. Huh. And people seem excited about Outlook. My, another thing has changed over the past six years. <laughs> All right, mark your calendars, folks. One last thing here. Nothing, the company, is going to announce the Nothing Ear 2 wireless earbuds during a live stream announcement March 22nd. Uh, if you remember, the Nothing Ear 1 was Nothing's first released product. So this is a, a big deal in its evolution. And that is a look at the quick hits. Well, with all the talk about generative AI and chatbots, you know, we got stories like these coming out every single day. It's easy to forget that less than a decade ago, a lot of the tech industry saw similar potential and definitely a lot of buzz in another emerging category, voice assistants. Apple's Siri was early in the market in 2012, but Amazon launched the original Echo speaker in 2014, and it remains the market leader. Insider Intelligence estimate it holds a 66% market share in the U.S. among Uh, voice assistants, and about 20% of all U.S. households use it. And 
More good news for Amazon. It just keeps coming. Engagements are up more than 30% on the year in 2022, and more than half of customers use it to shop. And, you know, that's kind of big for Amazon. IDC found an average Echo device owner interacts with the assistant at least once a day. That's better than its competitors, Google or Apple. Sounds like things are, are doing great. So why then is the Financial Times, where we pulled these numbers from, running a story with the headline, Amazon's big dreams for Alexa fall short? Ah, it's the economy. I almost said it's the economy stupid, but that makes it sound like I'm calling rich stupid, which I definitely am not. Uh, it's the economy. The economy is the problem. Amazon wants to make money off the Echo now. They're 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 done funding big dreams. Uh, the financial and the Financial Times sources say Amazon execs are even saying things to the voice assistant development team, like, "quote If you have anything you can do that you might be able to directly monetize, you should do it." Uh, <laughs> Part of this time, uh, part of this comes from the disappointing earning potential of skills. Those are the the apps that you can add on Amazon's platform. Uh, a problem that is you know not not unique to Amazon. Uh, Google calls them conversational access uh, actions, and they plan to end access to third party conversational actions in June, replacing those with voice functionality in Android apps. And of course, some of the shine has come off what people think of voice assistants. Uh, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, for example, said. They were all dumb as a rock. <laughs> he included Cortada in that. He was like, they're all bad. Uh, Rich, is this the end for voice assistants? I don't think so. I mean, people have carved out use cases for these, right, that make a lot of sense for them. They're just much more limited. And in some ways, we've, we've learned behavior that's like, okay, the voice assistant won't punish me if I try to say anything too complex. So I'm going to do kitchen timers, adding things to a to-do list, and and the three other things that people do with these. But that, that skills problem is a major problem. I think, you know, we all saw like, oh, there's a Jeopardy game that came out for, you know, Amazon or whatever. Like, the, we all saw like some press release like that sounds like fun and we tried to use it it was like this hemmed in weird experience it was hard just to even get into a lot of those so i i think this is the <laughs> this is amazon realizing they're they're ahead in a in a non-essential or i don't even want to say non-essential because it is when it works well it's great i love having a voice assistant like in the kitchen that's what it's designed for but they're ahead in a category that's like really hard to actually monetize and it seems like one that we've hit feature parity on right yeah, Nikki, you, you, do you use any voice assistants in your daily life or are you part of the so problem? Despite <laughs> someone who comes on DTNS once a month, I'm still one of those curmudgeons who's like, I don't want it to listen to me, even though mm -hmm. I don't have anything interesting going on in my kitchen. But I I haven't, I, my partner has one, so I've interacted with them and it, it still doesn't feel good enough to merit me buying one. Like I have friends who, when they walk into their house, they say, Alexa, oh, sorry, the, they say voice thing turn on the lights and i was like it would be so much faster to just switch on the lights i so disagree i that. disagree as someone who does exactly that it is really nice when I walk in the bedroom, you know, and my hands are full to just be like, turn on the bedroom lights and they go on and I don't have to put stuff down and fumble along, lie around for the switch. That said, I get what you're saying. Like, I'm not sure if it's worth, you know, $85 so <laughs> just yeah. to do that. And, and this is the problem. Anything that Amazon has tried to make extra money has annoyed me. Like, hey, your recent shopping history shows that you might want to buy hair dye. And I'm like, well, first of all, it's Stop not it. me. It's some, <laughs> it's another member of my household, Sawyer the dog. Uh, but also, no, we don't need any more. That was like a one-time thing. Stop, try, stop pushing things on me. So I'm concerned that these things that I do find very useful for very utilitarian and non-monetizable things mm -hmm. aren't going to be worthwhile in their current state. And the utility I get from them might go away. No one wants to give more money to Amazon unless it's for a really, really good reason. So they better come up with a really, really good reason that secretly doesn't piss anyone off. Yeah. yeah. Like the value add for all of these came in the free tier. And after that, it it always felt like yeah. we're, we're, we're getting some, we're, we're not getting the value that we were putting back into this. And w w the, the disappointing part of this is, I, I guess I just kind of expected the service to get better over time. And I originally, when I first set up my Alexa, like I was, I opted into the, yeah, you can save the recordings to improve the qualities of the service. And I never saw that. And then I turned it off and it was the exact same. So, yeah. and, and not even like understanding me specifically, like what I wanted to do is to be able to, and, and Google has tried to do this and they've failed. Like they, they have 
all, all, both of these companies have all the smart people working on this, but to like have any kind of contextual information of like, if I'm listening to a song and I say, play the rest of this album, I, n there is never going to be a world where a, where, where a voice assistant in their current carnation can do that. And that's where I think a lot of the excitement potentially with, you know, we're, we're starting to hear buzz about, hey, with chat GPT like thing, we're going to yeah. integrate that into our voice assistant. And if it can have a little bit more of that, I, I don't even know if ChatGPT can do necessarily that contextual understanding, but eventually, you know, hopefully. it's yeah. getting, I mean, I mean, ChatGPT has better contextual understanding than the current voice speakers, which have yeah. some contextual understanding. So uh, it, it, it's, it's promising, but as long how, as it's not too smart, that's how what do you want, make, right? <laughs> how do you make your money off of it is the thing. Can you just make money selling the product and then maybe charge a dollar a month for the service? Are people going to go for that? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. All right, let's uh, let's talk about dubbing YouTube videos. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we mentioned that YouTube expanded access for creators to upload dubbed audio to their videos in multiple languages. So, you know, we could have Daily Tech News show dubbed in another language, but YouTube is behind on this and creators may not use its feature because they're already using dubbed audio. Yeah, YouTube estimates two thirds of a creator's watch time comes from outside their home region. And restofworld.org reports creators have been making separate channels in various languages. Uh, a dubbing company called Unilingo signed up uh, top YouTube creators, uh, Mr. Beast, Dude Perfect, PewDiePie, Jubilee. The company estimates it's generated an additional $10 million by dubbing video in local languages. Unilingo charges a translation fee of 10% uh, or a translation fee plus 10% of ad revenues for dubbed channels. So you know, they're on board if they're successful. That's just one example. Uh, Unilingo is not alone. India's Harsha San uh, added Tamil and Hindi dubs to her native Telugu and added an additional 12 million subscribers when they did so. Pokemon added 15 million subscribers by dubbing its content in Hindi and Bahasa Indonesia. And if creators don't want to do it, fans will do it. Sometimes creators even have to take on their own entrenched fan translations if they decide they want to provide official ones. Uh, Nikki, do you see this as, as a future of YouTube growth? Is this something you could see yourself taking advantage of? You know, any increase in access for accessibility for everyone is good. Um, if there's people who don't speak multiple language and they can have better access to channels, then good. I, I don't really like watching dubbed stuff. I prefer to read subtitles, but, you know, I don't I see pros and cons to this. It's a shame that YouTube hasn't jumped on it because they they could be making revenue off of this. Um It's filling a niche and it seems to be a relatively big niche from these numbers. So. Um, I think that that that's growth that can happen. That can continue to happen here. I think they made the right move. I'm honestly shocked YouTube doesn't automatic like with, with the launch of the of the multi-channel, uh, so the multiple language stuff that they didn't launch like an integration of here are trusted service providers pay them, yeah. they'll send us a cut to do this. And, and like, it, I almost think it's because like if YouTube does that at scale, like that is a tremendous amount of of business. They, I'm sure there might also be liability that goes, well, I don't mm -hmm. even know. I don't even want to get into that whole aspect of it, but I am surprised that YouTube is not trying to find a way to monetize that. To monetize, given, yeah. Given that we're seeing that there is a tremendous appetite for it and, and kind of selfishly for myself, I, like I imagine there is increasingly going to be it, just a universe of content that's not in English that I'll, I'll either have to use uh, uh, subtitles for, but for some content where it's like, you know, where it's not like host driven, right? Where it's it's more, I don't know, like infographic kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah documentary yeah. kind of stuff. I would totally want dubbed versions of that. And so I am, I am happy to see that this is a continued trend. Like whoever, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but when there's creators that are going to have just cross more crossover appeal and they're out there, I'm just not finding them. Uh, I'm excited this selfishly for English as well as as much as for for other language for English content coming to other languages as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's you. I think you hit on it, which is a factual uh, oh something that's a voiceover of an animation or something where I'm not connected to the person talking. Uh, yeah, I want to dub because even if I do speak the other language, it's probably easier for me to understand in the language that I speak primarily, right? And that's going to be true for most people. So uh, I'm I'm all into that. On the other hand, you talk about dubbing Mr. Beast in Espanol. I I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm sure that works for a lot of people. However, 
part of the the connection with the creator is their voice, even if you don't speak it. I, I'm fans of a lot of Koreans on YouTube, and I don't want to hear them dubbed. I want to hear them speaking, and then I'll read subtitles because of that connection. So uh, it, apparently I'm wrong, though, because Mr. Beast <laughs> is getting millions of people to, to listen to him dubbed by the person who did Spider-Man, according well, to Unilingo. That, that's, but that's the thing. It's if you only ever found that channel, right? If you see there's Mr. Beast and Mr. Beast in Espanol, and you just click on that, and that's kind of your initiation. And you never met, you never knew it any other way. Yeah. And they're yeah. hiring top quality voice talent. I mean, that was the other thing. I was expecting this to be like industrial grade, like we're just, you know, uh, we got someone on Fiverr, we're throwing them at it. I mean, no, they're they're getting <laughs> yeah. like it's just me sitting there going, Anyanga Seo. Like, no, yeah. that's not. That's not <laughs> so I think can, the cool I, thing is you get the option. Mm -hmm. And that's what yeah. we want. We want more options. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good point because I it, because sometimes I will want subtitles, but maybe like you say, every once in a while it'll be like, oh yeah, I would I would like to have a dub on this. Uh, do you have a thought? Do you prefer dubs or subtitles, or have you figured out a third option? Uh, let us know. Email us about anything to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. <laughs> When we cover robots on the show, it's usually in the context of workplace automation, some big, scary Boston Dynamics robot meant for factories or, or maybe search and rescue. Uh, but robotics is about more than just physical labor, and it's about more than just size. Microbiologist Anna Santos from Rice University in Houston, Texas, and also at a university in Palma, Spain, and her colleague, chemist James Tour, are developing molecule-sized machines to fight bacteria from inside your body. Uh, Nikki, can you explain how this is going to be working? I'm confused. Yes, I'm so excited to talk about this. I saw this story and I said, DTNS needs to hear about this. So yes, absolutely. You, you've probably heard this either at the doctor's office or it's happened to you personally, but a lot of bacteria have started to develop resistance to traditional antibiotics. So we're always looking for a solution, either better antibiotics or other solutions. This falls into the other category. So these two scientists, instead of looking for a new antimicrobial compound, the microbiologists and chemists paired up to design these spinning microscopic machines that actually drill holes inside of infectious path uh, pathogens. Okay, so how I mean, I can I know that antibodies don't usually drill holes, so there's a difference. Correct. One, how else is this different than just developing like like with vaccines, like antibodies? Yeah. So instead of it being physiological, where you're trying to get your body to respond to these pathogens, it's actually mechanical. So the advantage of this drilling mechanism is that it doesn't already exist in nature. And so it makes it kind of impossible for the pathogens to evolve any resistance um, against it. And that's how mm -hmm. they were able to do it in the past. And these machines or these nano machines have actually shown some promising results uh, in initial trials against antimicrobial resistant infections. But of course, it still remains to be seen how this is actually going to work in the real world. Yeah. So how does this work? Yeah. So these are teeny tiny machines that are less than a micrometer in size, and they can incorporate these controllable moving parts. And this is not actually that new. The 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics actually went to Ben Ferragina um, for these types of organic motors. Uh, but applying this knowledge to um, antibacterial resistant bacteria, antimicrobial resistant bacteria, um, is what is the new part. So how they move, it actually is powered by either a chemical reaction, electrical energy, or uh, sometimes even light, which is sort of a form of electrical energy. <laughs> so these two scientists, uh, Santos and Tor. Uh, work together to create this nanomachine design using different molecular groups and compounds and specifically some that produce nitrogen. And that's because nitrogen can react with visible light and power another molecule group that starts to spin on its own. And uh, they just tweaked it until they got to a certain speed that was fast enough to bore through a bacterial cell. And they actually tested this on E. coli and Staphylococcus aureatus, which is the bacteria that's responsible for MRSA. And they were able to kill them in as little as two minutes. So pretty impressive. Yeah. So 
uh, I, I love this. Uh, they've they've engineered the molecules to make like a very a little tiny robot. Uh, I remember recovering some of Tour's early work of just making micro machines that could even walk. So now they've got spinning things and they can drill in. That all makes sense. Uh, and I guess if you can just put it on the skin's surface where there's visible light, uh, then you can control it there. That makes sense. A lot of infections that, that are topical that it can help with. But what about where the light don't shine uh any any progress there so they're still working on that as you know as it goes with science we always say we're still working on that um but they're testing infra for infrared light as a way to power these machines mm. nano machines even though it's a little bit less powerful it does have a longer wavelength so it can go a little bit deeper through the tissue than visible light and they're also working on more accurate targeting. Uh, yeah, you want these things to target specific cells and not all of your cells. Um, and so one thing they're considering is using other transporter nanomachines to deliver these mini drills to the correct cell types, like a cancer cell or even a fat cell, um, because anti uh, antibiotic resistance is not necessarily the only thing they can do. They could potentially deliver chemo. Uh, at least these are some future big ideas. Um, but yeah, you want to make sure they're going towards the right cells. Yeah. And and I, I think one thing I thought when I started reading this is the drilling was all that needed to be done, which I think in some cases may be true, but in other cases, you're still using it to deliver something inside the cell that kills it. Uh, like, like you're saying with, with chemo. So I can imagine this as sort of a, uh, there, there's, there's a molecule that has an antigen that's going to bind to only the things you want to damage. And then there's a process once it's bound that that will automatically open up and the little nano machine can then start drilling and delivering its chemo or, or, or whatever it's going to do. I, I imagine it as a very small 1930s gangster molecule, just shooting, <laughs> shooting cells. Yeah, I imagine holes. that's how they're going to work on the targeting. Um, they're also talking about like, little tiny nanomachines that they can actually pilot. Um, and ah, I'd love to see uh -huh. that as well. I'm, it's like Miss Frizzle. <laughs> like <with> yeah. little... <laughs> but then you could, Car you could load. steer it to exactly, you know, like a lesion or something Humor using. Or, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Really you wouldn't, cool. it wouldn't have to find it on its own. You could, you could get it there. That's, that's great. Yeah. yeah. I, I, next thing we need is just be able to shrink down and ride these ourselves, you know, and then exactly. it's total fantastic voice. Next month on DTNS. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, right, Rich, we, what time is it on the moon right now? You know, that's a very interesting question, Tom, and we might actually have an answer sooner than later. That's because during a meeting at the European Space Agency's ESTEC Technology Center in the Netherlands last year, Multiple organizations stressed the importance and urgency of defining a common lunar reference time. Now the ESA has announced that it's going to try to achieve LunaNet, a framework of mutually agreed upon standards, protocols, and interface requirements. Right now, space agencies and private companies just all kind of use their own various home time zones. You know, home is where the moon is, I guess, uh, for onboard <laughs> chronometers and two-way communication systems. A standard lunar time could make partnering on joint observations and overall communications just a lot easier. Someone will have to be in charge of lunar time, similar to how the BIPM is in charge of UTC on Earth. And UTC is based on inputs from a collections of atomic clocks maintained by institutions around the world. But you'll be able to, you know, set your watch to moon time for all of your moon visits, Tom. I'm very excited. Yeah. D GPS runs into small relativistic effects when it's in orbit, when the satellites are in orbit, because uh, because time is slower for something in orbit, infinitesimally, <laughs> but at the at the incredibly small amount of of deviance that you want with GPS, you need to account for that. So. So that's where these UTC atomic clocks come in is they know like, oh, you're that far away. OK, then you're probably running a little slow. Let me let me adjust and, and get everything in sync. Uh, there's nothing like that for the moon where satellites are in different orbits uh, around the moon. And is there going to be a thing on on the moon that's like UTC in Greenwich? That's like, here's the the baseline that we're all correcting uh, to. Mm -hmm. So this this is going to be important. The more operations we we have happening on the moon, we, we need moon GPS and moon UTC. 
the only thing just... that makes me sad about this is I have my my citizen watch right here that is synced up to the atomic clock. It syncs to the atomic clock every single day, so it's always right on time. And it has time zone around the dial, so I can set it if I'm tra- if I'm traveling mm. around the world, I can travel. Mm-hmm. I can set it, have it exact time zone, never have to worry about it. It's now going to be out of date when they set the lunar time. I won't have a yep. lunar option if I choose to travel. Now, do I travel outside of Eastern time at all? Never. Will <laughs> I travel that's, not the, that's not the point. Almost certainly yeah. not. It's the mm-hmm. capability. And now, citizen, get on is what I'm saying. I'm just yeah. imagining the scientists trying to work together and be like, okay, so he was on the left side of the moon in UTC, and then the other group was on the right side, but they right? were in China time. So how? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds painful. <laughs> yeah, you think metric to imperial is hard. My gosh. We're, we're going to figure this out. And everyone used the same lunar time. All right, let's, let's not have like one country hold out. My goodness. Uh, Speaking of the world, Nate Langson is here to tell us how the UK might handle the use of AI in education in this week's text message. Ah, thank you for having me. Well, this week we have talked about plans that are happening in the UK to let students use AI services like ChatGPT in their schoolwork. This is something being discussed with the exam bodies that set the tests and the exams, and there's actually a lot more enthusiasm for it than you might first expect, certainly more than I would have expected. You can get that at uktechshow.com. Ah, thank you, Nate. Uh, A wonderful discussion it was. I listened to it just this morning. Tom, can you help us out? Let's check what's in the mailbag. All right. Uh, Damon wrote in and said, Hey, DTNS crew, I really enjoyed the discussion on your show about EVs and range anxiety. One thing I'm surprised was missing from the conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, David. I always laugh when people say, I was surprised you didn't say this. We can't say everything. Don't be so surprised. Anyway, I'm kidding. Uh, one thing that was missing from the conversation about EVs is how cold temperatures can drastically increase charging times. I would really love to hear what some of your special EV guests have to say about how the climate can affect battery life and charging. I live in the Midwest and temperatures can get as low as 20 degrees below zero during the winter months months. Any guidance on this would be greatly appreciated. Keep up the great work. Damon. Uh, Thanks, Damon. I actually emailed Chris, who's the one who was having the conversation about range anxiety with us. He lives in Maryland, so it gets pretty cold there. And he said, first and foremost, expect range loss in colder temps, so plan your drives accordingly. It's not like it goes to zero, but you'll get a little less, so you'll you'll need to figure out, you know, how to adjust. Also, make sure you leave the EV plugged in when you can, so that it does not use the battery to warm up and if you can use your heated seats and steering wheel in lieu of running the actual heater that'll save you a little battery life as well during the cold times thank you chris ashley and thank you damon and thank you also to dr nikki ackermans for being on the show we're learning about molecular machines that are just murdering bacteria it's awesome dr nikki where can people uh, follow you online if they they want to follow your fine work People can find me at NicoleAckermans.com or the backwards version is Ackermans Nicole on Twitter while it's still here. And I've been saying that for like four months now. <laughs> so it's yeah. still here. And it's still here. It's the new SoundCloud. Hanging on by thread. <laughs> Uh, also, thanks to our brand new boss. Uh, we are only supported by you. It, it, we get advertising on the public feed, but let's be honest, we would not be able to do this show at the level we do it with just that. Uh, it is powered by the patrons. And thank you, Thomas, not me, uh, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Thomas. Excellent first name. Excellent choice to back us on Patreon. Uh, you are now, with all the rest of the patrons, going to get access to that extended show, Good Day internet yeah and thomas you're in for a fun conversation about how an insect's bathroom habits revealed a way to potentially make waterproofing gadgets more efficient it's very exciting and i can't wait oh my gosh (laughs) (laughs) you can also catch the show live monday through friday 4 p.m eastern 2100 utc find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow with nicole lee talk to you then This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>